Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise unto the rock of our salvation. Let's show the Lord how much we love him today.
If you truly love the Lord, let us give God a hearty praise this morning. He is worthy of all our praise. And I love him because he first loved me. While I was yet in my sins, he sent Jesus to die upon the cross on my behalf. And so I'm in love with the Lord. Our reading this morning is taken from, again, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 19 through 22 of the King James Version. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The word of the Lord.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord has changed everything by his matchless love. Bow with me. Father in heaven, we do genuinely love you. We love you, Master, Lord God of ours, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We're so very thankful, Father, that you have saved our souls. We're thankful, Father, that you keep us all along this Christian journey. We're thankful, Father, that we have heaven in our view, knowing, Master, that the Lord Jesus has gone away to prepare a place for us, that where he is, one day we shall be also. Father, we love you. We adore you. We exalt you on this wonderful day of worship. And Father, we pray that you will accept our worship. And please, Father, accept us in worship as we praise you, as we glorify you in this sanctified and sacred, sacred space this morning. Father, that we might all leave here better than we were when we entered. For all of us, Father, have come here this morning with things on us, in us, and before us that only you can make a difference with. So we come, Father, just as we are, loving you despite the things that challenge us. Father, please, Lord, Receive us in worship today, in Jesus' name, and for his sake, church, amen, amen, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. I greet all of you in the great and grand name of God, our Father, and in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was dead, but is now alive, and he is alive forevermore. Let's give God the praise, church. He is worthy. He is really, really worthy today. And to all of our visitors and guests, good morning. Bless you one and all. We are, we are gathered here this morning that we might celebrate the goodness of our God. How many of you know that God is good? How many of you really, really know that God is good. You know, when people are good to you, I was raised to say thank you. And so when you give God the praise with that hand clap of praise, you are saying thank you. So let's thank the Lord from the bottom of our hearts. Amen. It ain't about me. You can be angry with me, upset with me, kick me to the curb, but let's praise him together. Praise the name of the Lord. I would not allow anything to get in the way of my praising him. Amen. I can't, when I get to heaven, I can't say, well, you know, so-and-so kept me from praising you. There's no such thing. Praise the name of the Lord. So we are here to celebrate his goodness to us. And with that, as you can see, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper, and this depicts what the Lord has done for us, his suffering and his death. And we are to observe this and celebrate this until he comes again. Amen. So let's prepare our hearts and our minds to receive it. And if there's anything in your way, if there's any issues you have with God, any issues you have with your fellow man, let's, let's, let's get rid of that before we do this. Otherwise, you're eating it unworthily. We want to make sure that we have the Lord in our view when we do so. Amen. And the Bible says it this way. That's why so many of you among you that are sick and are asleep, which means dead, because they did not observe this as they ought. Praise the name 
of the Lord. Not frightening you, it's in the word, search it for yourself. Church, you need to know that when you fail in your faithfulness, and we all do, there's no one in here so strong that you're faithful to the Lord all day long, every day. We failed him, am I right? But know today that when you fail him in your faithfulness, he is faithful to forgive you and to restore you into proper fellowship with him. So don't be down on yourself just because you didn't make the grade. Amen. You do know that's what Jesus is all about. That's what grace is all about. We do the best we can with God's grace. And it's always beneficial to us every time. So when you fail, and you will, and we do, when you fail in your faithfulness, just know that God will forgive you and restore you to the fellowship that has been fractured. You can't be lost, but your fellowship can be damaged. Praise the name of the Lord. We do announce that there's a homegoing service for Mr. Leroy Teasdale, and he is the brother of our own Jesse Teasdale and the brother-in-law to Sister Jacqueline Teasdale, and uh, that uh, service will be held on this Tuesday. You can call our number at 314-421-5288, and there'll be someone there to give you all of the details in terms of where it will be held and the time, amen? Amen for all of you who want to, to go and support uh, that family. Please uh, call that number, 421-5288. Uh, there's also prayer requests for Sister Willie Watkins that her daughter Deborah told us about. There she is back there. So uh, keep her lifted up in your prayers. I also was told by a pastor friend who uh, I was... Uh, speaking with on yesterday, and as I was speaking to him, one of his members had gone into cardiac arrest, rushed her to the hospital, and she's unresponsive in ICU perhaps even today. So keep uh, Sister Ruby Whitaker and her entire family, her husband and her family, her two children, and uh, that church home lifted up in prayer. I also want you to pray for my mother, as you can see, she's not here today. There's no uh, drastic issues. It's just things that go along with being nearly 93 years of age. And so she wants you to pray for her, pray for my wife who is there ministering to her, if you would, and we would really, really appreciate that. And just pray for all of our, our sick and our shut in among us. Pray for one another. I, I, I have. People have told me, Reverend, you just seem like nothing bothers you. Something bothers me all the time. I can't afford to show that sense of weakness. Amen. I have to be a strength for you. But just as things happen to you, they happen to me. Just pray for me. Amen. As I pray for you. Having said those things, church, let us now enter into this prayer that is called the altar prayer. And this is a prayer, a general prayer, where as you're praying within yourselves, I am praying aloud for the many things for this church. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again we are here. And Father, we never tire of calling on your holy name. We never come, become fatigued in finding ourselves in prayer to you. So we fall, fall down, as it were, within your presence, knowing, Master, that you are in the midst of us. We have come here knowing that we can meet up with you in worship in this public and corporate fashion. Father, hear this your servant's prayer. Thank you for all of your rich, bountiful blessings toward us all. 
Father, forgive us of our sin. For certainly we have sinned against you. For we are all fallen, fallible, and finite creatures. And you know all about us. And we're thankful for the grace that you extend to us. For if it were not for your grace, we could not make it today. Despite many of us wanting to reach out and receive from you a miracle today, let us know that your grace is sufficient for us. Father, hear your servant's prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his redemptive work of the cross. He who paid a debt that he did not owe and a debt that we could not pay. Without him, we are hopeless. But with him, we are filled with hope. Without him, we are helpless. But he is our helper. And we are thankful. We are thankful for your Holy Spirit who indwells the hearts of all of us, we, your true believers. Father, we are born by him, spiritually so, and we are kept by him. And we are thankful that we are kept until the second advent, until the Lord comes again. And he will come. And it is our hope that he returns. And Father, we know that this is not a wish, but it is a strong expectation and anticipation of his return. And Father, we give you thanks. Thank you, Holy Master, for blessing and strengthening us one and all with the hope of Christ, with the hope of glory. We say hallelujah to your glorious name. Father, there is one who's there lingering, perhaps holding on to one last, last measure of life. You know her name. You know all about her. You know her husband. You know about those children. And Father, you know what it is that you will do. Help us to accept your will. For Father, we recognize and realize that you have determined our bounds by which we cannot pass. Some things are not within your permissive will. They are matters of your ultimate will. And no prayer will change it. So Father, we pray that your will be done. For when your will is done, we know that everyone's best interests will be served. Father, I pray for my mother. Father, I pray that you strengthen her. For she is a trooper of life. She's a truster. She trusts in you. Bless my wife who is there giving her care. And Father, we are glad that she is still able to move about. She's still clothed in her right mind. She is still able to do some of the mundane things of life for herself. We know it's only because of your grace and your mercy. Not only that, Father, bless all of our sick and our shut in. Some master who have been struggling, and I see at least one face here today, whom I love dearly and who loves me. And I'm thankful, Father, that I'm able to look upon her face. And I say thank you and hallelujah that she is in attendance here today. Not just her, but many, Lord 
Lord, bless us and strengthen us. Heal us, Holy Father. Give us the help that we need, that we might be a strong presence in this world, in this community, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, on our jobs, when we are walking and talking with each other along the way. Father, hear this your servant's prayer. Father, there's so much violence in the land. We hear mass shootings everywhere. Senseless taking of life. No value of life. Lord God, we pray that this church and all churches everywhere will be able to stem that flow of neglect for human life. That gun violence will be put down and the love of life will be lifted up. That we will take care and realize that every life is a life that has come from you. For only you can give life. Father, hear this your servant's prayer. Help us to come together. Help us to stay together. Help us to help one another. For Father, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And we are told to help bear the infirmity of the weak among us, those of us who are strong. So Father, those who are weak are those oftentimes those who misunderstand, those who are on the periphery of their faith, those who, Heavenly Father, are limited in the knowledge and the understanding of who they are and whose they are. Lord God, bring us together. Clarify our minds. Strengthen our hearts. Strengthen our bodies. Set us on fire this morning, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, as we are here, Master, worshiping you in the beauty of holiness. Lord, Bless the music ministry as they exalt you. Father, as they sing your sweet praises, and that those things might edify us, might strengthen us, might inspire us to go on and see what our, what our end will be. Lord God, there are many things we could say. But Father, we just say, let your will be done. Bless the tithe, the orphan, and the pledge, and those who did attend to it. And Father, let it always be enough to supply the needs and the wants of this ministry. We ask and say these things in Jesus' name. And for his very sake, let all the church say amen. 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 God bless you, church, and God strengthen you forever as we are here in this barren land here below. Singers, you can come on up. When I finish the prayer, that's your cue. Praise the name of the Lord.
have to stop now. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is due our God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. How can you say you love God and hate your neighbor, your brother, whom you see every day and you have never ever seen God with your eyes. The Bible says you are a liar and the truth is not in you. Amen. There needs to be some proof of love. We can shape our mouths to say most anything, but your actions tell a whole nother story. Do you really love the Lord? Do you really love the Lord? And I suggest you need to start living just like that, like you love him. And the only way you can live like that is, is live well with and before your fellow man. Praise the name of the Lord. We are supposed to be the children of the Most High God. The Bible calls God love, says God is love. And if we are his children, we ought to look like him sometimes. Show somebody some love. Sometimes it's difficult to love, isn't it? It's, it's difficult to show love to people who just don't love you. But remember, before you even knew anything about God, he was already in love with you. Amen. And there's nothing, there's nothing you can do, I can do to change his mind. He's going to always love us. But what about us? Do we truly love him is the question. Father God in heaven, it is in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we bow in your gracious presence again, dear Father. And we have come to this portion of the service, dear Master, that is certainly truly pregnant with preaching. And preaching is want to be made. And Father, I pray that you'll take me and use me as an instrument of your will, that your word may be delivered in this place today and before your face. Father, I pray that you will speak a word into this atmosphere, speak a word into our hearts, our minds. Speak a word, O oh, Heavenly Father into our life situations. Speak a word, Father, that will answer all of our inquiries. Speak a word, O Heavenly Father, that will dispel all doubt. Speak your word today, dear Master, and we shall be careful to always give you the praise. And I pray that the words of my mouth, as well as the meditations of my heart, be found acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my strength, my redeemer. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Amen. And amen. I just want to say I wasn't told to do it, but I'm going to do it. I want you to pray for Mother Beverly Primus. Uh, whether you know it or not, there was an episode here a few weeks back that hurt her. And uh, she was in pretty bad condition there for a minute, but she has recovered extremely well. And her hopes are to be here on next Sunday morning. And I just want you to keep praying for her. The ushers and the health unit ministry here did an excellent job. I won't go into all the details, but it happened right here while we were worshiping. And it shook the resolve of some of our ushers, well, all of our ushers on duty and our health unit uh, um, 
members, and they uh, did. I just they did an excellent job. I I can't say enough about it. <laughs> Amen. And also, before I get into this, uh, I want you to pray for uh, Sister Ruby Jones. Sister Ruby Jones has been on hospice for quite a while. And I received word just the other day that the nurse said it won't be long. So pray for her and pray for her family, Sister Paula, her daughter, the baby girl, amen, is, is here as well. But uh, Sister Ruby Jones served well as long as she could, in any capacity she could. And Ruby Jones, if, if she, she'll be 94 this year, She'll be 92 this year. I'm thinking about someone else. My mother will be 93 this year, but Sister Ruby Jones will be 92 this year. So pray for her and strengthen her. Um, um, we've seen her and uh, uh, she's well taken by Alzheimer's and uh, you uh, just pray for one another. You, I've seen that happen many times. My dad had dementia when he passed. It's not an easy thing to see. Uh, one of my best friend's father, whose father was like a father to me, Mr. William Ward Sr., passed with Alzheimer's, and it's not a good thing to see. It's a, a sense of robbing a person of their human dignity. But pray for them. Amen? Pray for them. Having said that, I had to say that because it's just gnawing at me. I had to say it. And... Uh, Go with me now to the Gospel according to St. John. And I want you to find your places with me in the 21st chapter. And I'm going to begin reading at the 14th verse and through the 17th verse of this book and chapter. And these words are recorded. I'm reading from the King James Version. You may have a different version, and certainly that's okay. These words are recorded. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith to him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Verse 15, where our emphasis is, will be placed, so when they had dined, Jesus said to him, Simon Peter, uh, said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Verse 17 is the other verse where we place emphasis. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. He was saddened. 
because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And the title of this message is found in these three words, proof of love. Proof of love. Proof of love. You've heard it said, if you haven't heard it anywhere else, you've seen it in movies. You've heard it in movies when someone is kidnapped and those who were doing the kidnapping, those kidnappers, were demanding certain sums of money. <clears throat> and then the person who was to pay up, or that person who spoke for the, the party that was supposed to pay up, would ask for proof of life. They wanted to know that that, that one who had been kidnapped was still alive. I'm here today to let you know that God wants to see some proof of love. Amen, somebody. Do you love him? Do you really love him? Amen, somebody. Do you love him? Do you love him like he wants you to love him? Do you even know what that is? Proof of love. We don't mind loving the Lord like we want to love him. That's easy. But when you love him the way he wants you to love him, that may not be so easy for you. For love can only be known by the actions that it prompts. Proof of love. When I sit down and I deal with couples and others, and I give them certain tools to work with in their relationships, one of the things I talk about to them when they talk about forgiving one another, and one of the problems that they face is they're always wanting to say for, they forgive that person in their own language as opposed to saying, I forgive you in the language of the one that's offended. Saying it in a way that that person will accept. Well, I said, I'm sorry. Yeah, like you wanted to say it. But not like they wanted to hear it. And see it. We want to love the Lord how we want to love him. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? This passage deals with one of the post-resurrection appearances of Christ. We need to know that the disciples had returned to the region of Galilee as they had been instructed. And they were instructed to wait, to wait for Jesus. And as they waited, Peter addressed the group, informing them that he was going fishing. He was going to go do something that he was good at. And he was going to do something that he was doing when Jesus found him. Is anybody listening to me? 
Peter and six others of the original 12. With Peter that made seven. They went fishing. And they went fishing and they fished all night. Not catching a single fish. I was kind of reminiscent of what he told them on the night that he was betrayed. He said, without me, you can do nothing. We need to know today that without the Lord, what we ought to do, how we ought to live in this world, we can do absolutely nothing. So the risen Lord Jesus Christ, see the scenario. He showed up on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, also called and known as the Sea of Galilee. He showed up there that morning. He questioned them from the shore. He called out to them. And he questioned to them about the success of their efforts at fishing. He says, have you caught anything? And they responded, no, they hadn't caught a thing. They fished all night. These are experienced fishermen. They fished for a living. Some of their best fishing was done at night. They were on their boats. They had lanterns on their boats by which they fished by. They didn't fish with a pole and string. They fished with nets. And they would throw over the nets and drag their nets to hopefully to catch the fish where they believed the fish were. And they did that throwing their nets and dropping their nets over and over and over again all that night and didn't catch a thing. Jesus shows up on the shore that morning. And he calls out to them and says, have you caught anything? And they said no. And upon hearing the response of their failed efforts, he instructed them to try it his way. You know how when you try to love the Lord your way and it ain't been working for you? Amen. You need to start learning how to love him his way. He, he told them, try it my way. Throw your net on the right side. They've been fishing on the wrong side. <laughs> All night long. Anytime you're fishing without Jesus, you're fishing at night, and you're fishing on the wrong side. Is anybody hearing me? So he said, throw your net on the right side. And he said, I declare unto you, you're going to find some fish. And they threw their net over, and they successfully caught 153 fish, where they could barely drag that full net to shore. And that miracle catching those fish manifested that the man on the shore was the master. There are some things that can happen in your life that if you are a child of God, you know that only, only Jesus could have done it for you. When you see that, you'll You'll do like the disciples did. They, the one shouted out, he said, and that's the master. Oh, vulgar Peter, fishing without clothing. They said that he put his coat about him. He put his clothing about him, and he, and he threw himself over into the sea and swam to shore to meet the master. You, you do 
know that it does not matter where you are and what shape you're in when you recognize that it is the Lord. You need to clothe yourself up with some faith and, and throw yourself and make your way to the shore and meet him. And I declare when you live a life of such faithfulness, just as when Peter jumped over and swam to shore, the others followed him, there's going to be some folk following you to the Lord. I wonder how many of you got folk following you to church, following you to the faith in Jesus Christ. How many folk do you have following you? They made their way to the shore. I'm just telling the story. When they got to the shore, Jesus had already started making breakfast. Amen. I can imagine that these men were hungry. Jesus, being the hospitable Savior that he is, had already started breakfast. He had some fish grilling. And he invited them to come and eat with him. And they shared in the prepared breakfast with Jesus that day. And after the breakfast, Jesus knows how to do it, doesn't he? It's hard to talk to a person that's already hungry. Am I right? It's hard to give somebody some hard news on an empty stomach. It's hard to get a person to hear where you are coming from and they're hungry. They're listening more to their hunger than they are to you. Why don't you hurry up and tell me what you got to say? Don't you know I'm hungry? And Jesus feeds them. And I can imagine in my mind's eye, I don't know if this is how it happened, but I can see him put his arm around Peter and say, take a walk with me, Peter. And he took Peter aside and he did that that he might prove his forgiveness to Peter and his rest restoration for Peter and also for Peter to profess and prove his love for him. Every now and then, church, you just got to have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. Am I talking to anybody? Oh, they said that I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice that I hear falling on my ears, the Son of God discloses. He walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. And the joy that we share is we tarry that none other has ever known. Speaks of an intimacy. You may have your walk with the Lord, but it ain't like my walk. Hallelujah, somebody. It's an intimate thing. So he takes Peter, the same Peter that had denied him three times. The same Peter that said, the Lord, I'll go to jail with you if it's necessary. I'll give my life for you, Lord. Peter denied him. Three times. While in the courtyard of the premises in the house of the high priest that night, when you're there and someone discovers him and says, You know him. Peter said, I don't know him. A little while longer, they said again, You know him. Peter says, I don't know him. 
Some young lady says, yeah, you know him, I've seen. Peter got upset. The Bible says he cursed. He said, did I tell you I didn't know him? Three times. I wonder. Saints, are you really living out loud for the Lord? Or are you living in denial of him? Brothers and sisters, putting Jesus before all is pure proof of your love for him. I love my wife of 49 years. I'm glad she's never left me. <laughs> Amen, somebody. But I just can't put her before the Lord. You say, well, what do you do, Pastor, where we go before the Lord together? Putting Jesus before all is pure proof of your love for him. Let us examine. First, standard for proof. Standard for proof. Verse 15. Let us also examine stress for proof. Stress. Press. A person for proof. Verse 17. Verse 15 reads, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon, Simon, to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? Sometimes the argument of what the text meant is still going on with brilliant minds. And they wanted to know whether or not Jesus was in reference to the fishing game or did he love him more than any of the other disciples loved him. Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? In the Greek, these, that term, in terms of their grammar, carried a neuter and a masculine tone to it. And they kind of carry the same force wherever it's said, so it's hard to determine quite what it meant. He said unto him, yea, or yes, Lord. It's always good to say yes to the Lord. And he puts it on Jesus and said, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, feed my land. And you say, then he says, sheep twice. Lambs young and vulnerable. Sheep mature and strong. He says, feed those who are weak, young and vulnerable, and feed those who are strong and mature. Standard for proof. The Apostle Peter, on that tense field night, prior to the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he made a vow. And he says, though I 
should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. The text tells us that likewise said all the disciples. So don't just put it on the Peters, but on all of us who claim we love the Lord, claim we'll go all the way with him. You'll find that in Matthew 26 and 35. Peter's impetuous vow is also found in Mark 14 and 31, Luke 22 and 33, and John 13 and 37. But just as Jesus predicted and announced when the time presented itself for Peter to prove his love for Jesus, he failed. He denied knowing Jesus. Hallelujah, somebody. And not just once, not just twice, but three successive times he denied somewhere along the line. Couldn't he have changed his mind? And say, yes, I know him. But three times he was asked. Three times he stood on his conviction of not knowing him. How many times have we been given opportunity to say we know him? And we live like we don't. Over and over again. I know people like to put you on a guilt trip. They tell me all the time, say, you're supposed to be a Christian. You're supposed to be a pastor. I ain't supposed to be. I am. I may not be the Christian you want me to be, and I may not be the pastor you want me to be, but I'm here to let you know I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. Hallelujah, somebody. And I have been anointed and appointed to be the pastor over this flock. And I want to live like I know him. Church, when we fail in our faithfulness, our faithfulness to stand for Jesus, it gives us the opportunity to learn to learn to stand on the standard Jesus set. Jesus came to die. Jesus decided to die. Jesus did die for the sins of the world, proving just how much he loves us. Jesus called Peter by his original name. Jesus had given him another name. He called him Peter or Cephas or Rock. He gave him a new name. You don't know that when you get with the Lord Jesus Christ, you get a new name. All of us got it. You know me as Ralph, but for him, I'm servant. Everyone that knows the Lord is a servant of the Most High God. He changed your name. Servants don't go do like they want to do. Servants do as they're told. Nobody make you be a servant. You chose to be a servant. Is anybody listening to me? Hallelujah. So Jesus calls Peter by his original name, Simon. Because Simon was the fisherman. You going to walk with me? Because Simon was that vulgar man who loved to curse and swim naked, a fish naked. Brawny and brawn and willing to fight at the drop of a hat. 
That was Simon. Am I talking to anybody? Just think about what you were like before the Lord got his hands on you. You got some Simon in you. Because Peter called him Simon because Peter had fallen back from his credibility of strength and stability in his faith to be to be Simon. I find myself falling back being Ralph. Just like Brother Peter, old man Simon, I used to love to curse. Every other word coming out of my mouth was a curse word. Amen, somebody. But the Lord knows how to put his hands on you and give you a new vocabulary. Praise the Lord. Oh. So he went back to being Simon. Brothers and sisters, you can't prove your love for Jesus by going back to old ways. Doing old things. By being the Simon you once were. You can't show your love for Christ. Backbiting. Lying on folk, assaulting their character, tearing them down. Stop being Simon. Start being Peter. So we need to sign up, stand up on the standard that Jesus set. Jesus has not told us to do anything that he has not done himself first. There's not a thing I've told this church to do that I had not already been doing and things you don't know anything about that helps this church stay afloat. That's what God does with the pastor. Does things with him that all of you all sitting out here would not do because you wasn't called to do it. You're not anointed to do it. You don't have the resolve to do it. And if I wasn't anointed, I wouldn't do it either. But the Lord has his hands on me. But the Lord is always taking care of me. So I stand upon the standard that the Lord Jesus Christ has set. Jesus, that morning after breakfast, systematically questioned Peter about his love for him. Lovest thou me more than these? When it comes to anything, everything, and all other things, the standard is, the standing requirement is, you must love Jesus more. You can apply that to anything. More than your mama. More than your daddy. More than your wife. More than your husband. More than your children. More than your grandchildren more than your sick children, more than your dying children. Love him. He'll take care of everything else. My father used to say to me, I asked him, let me drive the car one time, I knew better. And he shot me down and sat me down. He said, son, this car is not for joy riding. He said, this car for me to go back and forth to work to make a living for my family. He said, I need my car. It's not for joy riding. And he says, I have to take care of me first. 
so that I can take care of you. You put him first, and he'll always take care of you. You must love Jesus more, unselfishly. Watch. With the readiness to serve. That's what Jesus was asking him. Do you love me with an unselfish love, with a steadfast love, with a love that says you are ready to serve, always accessible, always available to serve at the drop of a hat? No longer fishing. Jesus wasn't calling him to fish for fish. He was calling him to feed lambs and sheep. No longer doing what you want to do, in other words, church, but what he wants. Do you know what he wants you to do? Consistently and constantly doing what Jesus commands earns his forgiveness and restores you from your failure making you eligible for a life of service. You can't serve him if you still got stuff between you and him. He had to clear the air with himself and Peter before he could get Peter an assignment. Perhaps you got something between you and the Lord. Instead of keep and continuing doing the same thing you've been doing for the last 30 years. Every time I look around, the Lord is having me to do something more. I gave my life to him, and the next thing I knew, I was teaching Sunday school. Then general superintendent of Sunday church school. Deacon, chairman of the diaconate. Vice president of the corporation of the church. And I thought that ought to be enough. Then he called me to preach. I says, Lord, I'm doing everything else. Isn't this enough? He says, feed. My lamb, feed my sheep. When I look at that exit sign, I'm 70 years old. I said, Lord, I'm ready to, to make my exit now. Then he sends young pastors and preachers to me, wanting me to talk to them. Wanting me to mentor them. Because I ain't through yet. Standard for proof. Then stress for proof. Verse 17 tells us He saith unto him the third time, meaning Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said it once. He had said it twice. Now this is the third time he asks him. Lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. One of the Greek terms for love is agape, agapeo, depending on whether it's a noun or a verb. Lovest thou me? 
agape o, that unconditional, unselfish, steadfast love. And Peter kept telling him, Philio, Philios, yeah, I'm your friend. Yeah, I, I have some affection for you. My wife wants more than affection. A dog can give you affection. A canary can give you affection. Goldfish give you affection. <laughs> My wife wants me to love her. This verse reveals Jesus stressing to Peter the importance for him to understand the necessity of proving his love for him. It's necessary for you to prove your love for the Lord. Strong winds may blow I know a savior and he's, the winds are going to blow strongly. The storms are going to come. Will you stand? I've had many things done to me, perhaps 90% of it you all have no clue about. Of things that people have done to me just because I'm a Christian and just because I'm the pastor of this church. There are pastor fighters wherever you go. My pastor used to tell me, you, you're darned if you do and you're darned if you don't. Because he would never say the other word. He wouldn't bring himself to say that word in front of me. And I don't think he ever did. If you do right, you can be in trouble with folk. If you do wrong, you're going to be in trouble. He said, just do what the Lord tell you to do. And everything will be all right. My pastorate here is not dependent upon you, but the Lord. Just don't get yourself into trouble with the Lord because of me. <laughs> so you need to know that there's a necessity for you to prove your love for the Lord. Because those storms are going to come. You may be made to look like a fool. Three times, Jesus posed and pressed the question, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? First and second times, Jesus pressed Peter. The term he used for love expressed the great value and serious regard Peter was to have for him and his ministry each of those times, Peter answered with a term that expressed less. Peter's answer was, yes, Lord, you know that I cherish you. That term didn't express the value. It didn't carry the same weight, the same value, esteem, and readiness to serve as did the term that Jesus wanted him to use. Jesus kept posing that to him because that's what Peter was supposed to say in response. He refused. It might have been because the text doesn't tell us, but if I were to speculate, it might have been because he knew that the Lord would have him do something else. He'll fail again. So he refrained from saying it. Though Jesus kept pressing him, And so when he got down to the third time, he used the term that Peter says. He, in other words, he said, are you really my friend? Do you really cherish me? Do you even have that affection for me? That's what grieved Peter. And perhaps at that time, the third time, just like three times made him curse in the courtyard of the high priest, the night of Christ's betrayal.
Jesus presses him this third time. He stresses to him this third time. Peter was agitated. Peter was upset. Peter was saddened. Peter was grieved. He was hurt. He remembered. He's on this beach, and Jesus is making fish that morning, and they hadn't caught anything, and they got to shore, and there the fish is being broiled, and he, this, this, these, these coals that were keeping the fire going and, and broiling the fish, that came up before Peter's nostrils. Those are triggers. And it made him remember that night when he was warming himself by the fire and the coals that kept the fire going it was in his nose and his nostrils. That triggers in your life. It causes you to remember when you denied him. The problem with that is you get mad with your fellow saints because you failed. We all fail. Let's not get upset. Let's just get up and love him like he wants us to love him. Some want to love Jesus on their own terms. But acceptable proof of love is what Jesus stresses. The love that answers the question that was asked. Not answering how you want to answer, but answering as he asked. Many relationships fail, and you need to know this, because of mismatched love. Jesus kept saying agape, agapeo. Peter kept saying filio, filios. They don't go together. One is more supreme. One is greater. It's a greater expression of love. People get married and one person got his whole hand on the, on the table showing it and the other one put half the hand down and holding the other hand up so he can't see it. Mismatched love. And until that is resolved, it ain't going to never get together. Just thought I'd say that. When faced with the terrible threat of, to himself, the Simon in Peter denied Jesus three times they're doing this to him, this one that can walk on water, this one that can feed 5,000 with two fish and five barley loaves, this, this one that can raise the dead. They're doing this to him. What would they do to me? So Peter said, no, I don't know him. The third time he denied knowing Jesus, he did it cursing Stressing how he loved himself more than he loved Jesus. Do you love yourself more than you love the Lord? How many times have you failed yourself? How many times have you been upset with yourself about you? Likewise. When Jesus asked, Jesus asked Peter the third time, using Peter's term, he, he asked him, do you even cherish me? Do you even have affection for me? Am I even your friend? Peter was so deeply saddened and hurt by what Jesus asked the third time. Undoubtedly, it reminded him of when he denied Jesus three times. Brothers and sisters, true repentance can't be made if the fault that was committed is not clearly in mind. Unless that's truly in your mind and in your heart when you are confessing your fault before the Lord, 
you just talking. We think we can hide it for him because it is so nasty. And what I mean by that is it's not all that holy and righteous. So that's nasty to God. It's just like stuff you've done in your life and you just don't want your parents to know. You don't want your spouse to know. You don't want your children to know the nasty stuff you've done. So we don't mention it. We hide it. Peter needed to come clean. He needed to open up Peter's profession of love and his sorrow-written repentance sealed the deal. Because that's the best Peter could do. Peter was then ready for the proof of love service that Jesus was going to put him into. He says, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Minister to the immature and weak as well as the mature and strong. In other words, he said, you say you love me, now prove it. Jesus died on Calvary's cross. That was his proof of love. He sealed the, the deal when on that third day morning he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. Proof of love. That's why the song was being sung this morning when we introduced the service. I really love the Lord. Do you love him? Do you even know what that means? When you look at your spouse and your children, your parents, your loved ones, and your friends, and you talk about how you love them, do you really love them? Despite what Peter did, Jesus never stopped loving him. But he forgave him. And he restored him. Now, don't go and say, well, you know, see, that ain't did all that for me. Just make sure you did what Peter did and repent. I knew an old man. And he loved to stay out on the weekend, gambling, carousing, and whatnot. And then he would try to go home early Sunday morning. He had sense enough to unlock the door, open it up, take his hat off, and throw it inside. So I asked him, what was that all about? He said, if it stayed in, I could come in. I said, well, how many times had it been thrown back out? He said, too many times. <laughs> and I don't want to mention it. When you stay out late, carousing in the assignment that you used to be in life, Know how to throw your hat in before you go in. Repent. And I guarantee you, every time you do that, the hat will stay inside and you can go back in. Proof of love. Praise the name of the Lord, church. Praise the name of the Lord. The invitation to Christ is now extended. If you don't know the Lord and you're pardon of your sin, you may come today by letter, by Christian experience, or 
as a candidate for baptism. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ that God has raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe unto righteousness and it's with your mouth that confession is made unto salvation. Come today, whether here or virtually speaking, if you're home and you're viewing this or wherever you are, to make that step, we can help you. All you need to do is call us at area code 314-421-5288. And someone will answer and help you. Just leave your name, your number, and that brief message. And we'll help you make that step. It doesn't have to be a step here uh, at Greater Leonard, but a step to the Lord. And we'll help you get to a church, a healthy church, where you can grow, you can serve. Come to him today. He has proven his love for you. He died to remit your sins. He died to set you free of the bondage and condemnation of sin. He died. And I'm thankful today that he didn't stay dead. But he arose on that third day morning. Hallelujah. If you're here today, come to him. You may be saved, but you may be out of church. You don't have a church home. You don't have a, the covering of a pastor. You, you can come today. You too can make that call. Someone will return that call and help you make that step of returning. Returning unto the Lord, returning to the flock. Because when I preach, I always ask the Lord, let me preach that it might glorify you, that it might edify the saints that it may evangelize the lost and cause those who have strayed to return. That doesn't mean shouting a person. That means reasoning with that person. That means reaching them where they are in their Christian walk. Sometimes they stray. Come today. Come without delay. Come just as you are. Come without money. Come without price. Salvation is free. For Jesus paid it all. All to set you free, he has paid. To relieve your consciences of that burden of guilt of sin those things that keep you from progressing, from reaching the purpose that God gave you. It's not someone else, it's you. Come, let him help you. Come, let him set you free. Father, in the precious name of Christ our Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to have heard from heaven in a sobering way that put something on our minds and upon our hearts. Thank you, Father, for showing us the standard. Thank you, Father, for stressing the point. Thank you for your word that we find to always be both lamp and light. Father, I pray for that one who is making a decision about Christ. 
accepting him as their personal savior. That one who is strayed that needs to return. That one that is unchurched that needs to be churched. We pray for them now, Lord. That your blessings will rest upon them. And they won't rest until they come to you. This we ask and say in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let all the people of God say amen. 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 Let's prepare our hearts and our minds for the observance of the Lord's Supper. Let us all stand as we prepare to leave this place, but never his presence, we do so in this fashion. of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with all of us. Henceforth, now and forevermore, let every believing soul say, Amen. Amen. God bless you, and go in peace. Go in peace.